you so much. It's so lovely to be here. Um, here, of course, is my office <laughs> where I am all the time these days, um, but it's lovely to be with you. Uh, I thought I'd read a portion of the first essay in the book, which I haven't read since narrating the audiobook, so bear with me. When my daughter was in second grade, she struggled with anxiety at bedtime, about death in particular, but also about the future in general. I would tuck her in at night and lie with her in the dark, holding her, listening. When will I die? She'd asked. Will you definitely die before me because you're older? The questions kept coming. Will we miss each other when we're dead? Will we even know we're dead? When will it happen? Will we feel it? Life is long, a long book, I told her, and you're only on the first chapter. Who wants to ruin a book by worrying about the end the whole time? Who wants to know how a book will end? That would be boring, she said. And of course she was right. Life is a book, long if we are lucky, and we write it as we go. The ending isn't written waiting for us to arrive. I'd known this all along, logically, but I hadn't yet felt it. I thought that I knew my story. I thought that what I was living was the whole story, but it was only a chapter. To revise means literally to look at again, to re-envision. Revision has always been my favorite part of writing. I know some writers love the rush of the new idea, the getting it down, the honeymoon period with a story or poem when it's still sparkling. But for me, the problem solving is what I love most, the challenge posed by the not right words and the not right order. I believe in the importance of revision, but here's something I believe just as strongly. If you're not careful, you can revise the life right out of a piece of writing. If you're not careful, you can scrub all the weirdness and wildness right out of it. As counterintuitive as it sounds, you can polish it dull. The same applies to our lives. If we are not careful, we can revise the life right out of them. We can polish our lives dull. When I think about revising my life, I think about learning to see it anew and to see in it possibilities I could not see before. For almost all of my adult life, I told my story in first person plural, we. Now the we is an I. Now the only plural is possessive, our children. And yet, of course, the children are not ours. We do not own the children any more than we own each other, which is to say, not at all. But I know one thing for certain, our stories belong to us. I'm the protagonist in my own life, or damn well should be, and you're the protagonist in yours. Whether you're on the first draft of your life or the second or the 10th, it's yours to keep writing and all of its messiness and fragility and terror and beauty. Our lives may not unfold the way we'd hoped or expected, but the alternative, flipping to the end of the book, knowing the ending before we get there, is not only impossible, but joyless, polished, dull. As my daughter said in her eight-year-old wisdom, that would be boring. Revising our stories, our lives, is no easy task. Our stories may take strange turns. We may find that we are living part mystery, part romance, part comedy, part tragedy, part ghost story. We don't know what will happen next or how it will end, but we keep moving. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna like just take a minute because I was just about to burst into tears. Oh, Unfair right. that I have to follow that. Maggie, that was so beautiful. And the whole time you were reading, I was like petting your book, <laughs> which I've been doing very frequently, which is why everybody on this, uh, this event should buy this book immediately. If not for the gorgeous words within, then just because like this feels like velvet and it makes you feel like everything somehow will be okay. So get this <laughs> and a weighted blanket and you're set. Um, but Maggie, like every time you write something, you put something out there, I am so moved, I am so inspired and I am very encouraged. Um, and so I feel like we run the risk, you and me, of talking for about a thousand years. But what I'm gonna do is try and condense all of that into 30 minutes and then we'll move to some Q and A's. Um, 
So I'd love to just start by, I, you know, like we've gotten to know each other over the last several months. And I know that you, you think of yourself as a recovering pessimist, which is so refreshing because these days I feel like I'm doing everything I can to not be a raging pessimist. So can you like clue us into that and also share some of the secret sauce with us? You know, I, I think a lot of us do this, which is um, use pessimism almost as self-protection, which is to say, if I expect the worst and I do this sort of worst case scenario thinking, then if the worst happens, I was right. And also I had sort of prepared myself for that outcome. I had been sort of clenched up waiting for that to happen anyway. Um, and if the best happens, then we're just pleasantly surprised. But we've then spent all of that time thinking about it in a negative way, um, really poisoning the present before any bad news actually hits. And so um, I had always been the sort of Eeyore in my family, even as a kid, sort of always expecting the worst. I'm not going to do well on this test. He's not going to call. They won't want that poem. Um, it's probably going to rain, dot, dot, dot. And, you know, it's, it's almost, it's easy to be a cynic and sort of a pessimist when everything's going fairly well. But when things really go haywire, you can't function if you don't think it's going to get better. So at the hardest time in my life, I sort of counterintuitively turned to optimism as a way to get through it. And at first, it was me talking myself into it. Um, like, it's going, to, it's going to be okay, right? Um, but I found that the more I thought about how things could be okay, and really, as many things can go right as can go wrong. So why are we not funneling more of our energy toward the right side of things? Um, the more I started holding myself in that mindset, the more surprised I was that I felt better. Because even if I got bad news, I didn't poison the time waiting for that news by expecting it to be bad. I just sat in the sun, not thinking about the storm coming. And if the storm came, then I dealt with it then. And if it never came, then I hadn't ruined all that time. I had just let the sun shine on my face, if that makes sense. Um, and so, yeah, I think we actually need it more when it's hardest mm -hmm. to do. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just sort of talking yourself through it and also remembering, thinking back to the last five years, yes, a lot of hard things have happened for all of us, but a lot of good has happened too. And so why wouldn't the next five years be more of the same? A balance, of mm -hmm. course. Um, you know, that's, I think that's how we need to sort of, that's what I mean by keep moving, is pressing forward, not just expecting mm -hmm. the worst. So, one of your poems, Good Bones, and I think that probably a lot of people here tonight are familiar with it. Um, it went viral when it was published, and it was the same week as the mass shooting uh, at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando in 2016. And people just really glommed onto it. And for anybody who, for anybody who's somehow not familiar with Good Bones, it's this poem, and you know, the the the, the premise is that you're really like, um, you know, I don't, I'm not going to recite it for you, but it's about like really trying to like sell this world, this like crumbling, terrifying world, sell the idea of this world to your children so that you can pull yourself through and you can pull them through and they can pull themselves through uh, during times where you're also trying to sell it to yourself too. It's like, you know, you're really trying to pull yourself up as well. And, you know, it came out during the shooting. Um, I think PRI, Public Radio International, named it the official poem of 2016, um, something that will never be described with regard to anything that I do. And you and I have had the chance to talk a lot about 
this time, this experience for you. And something you said beforehand really struck me. You said you kind of suddenly became this literary first responder mm. because all of a sudden everybody was posting like, good bones, good bones, good bones. Like, you know, like I, you know, I, you could sell them, you could make this place beautiful. And it was on all of our social media. And, you know, to a certain person, if you hadn't heard of this poem before, it was like, almost like a Portlandia episode, like what's wrong with you? You're so <laughs> not in the loop. So can you tell us more about that experience of like writing this poem, putting it out there and all of a sudden being like the go-to poem for when shit hits the van? When things get hard. Yeah, I mean, I, I've called that poem a disaster barometer because whenever it's shared widely and my social media mentions start to tick up, I know something bad has happened in the world. It's like a bat signal that goes up into the sky. Um, it was a really uh, strange experience and continues to be a strange experience to have something I wrote as one mother about raising kids uh, in a world that I barely understand myself. Um, and therefore I'm having a hard time sort of translating it to them. Um, to have it speak to so many people was very unexpected. I mean, as as a poet, I'm very used to my audience being poets <laughs> um, and not actors or musicians or politicians. Um, so that was really strange, although in some ways it was really good practice for writing Keep Moving because it um, got me over the, uh, the sort of fear of saying something to a lot of people and divulging information about, about myself and my feelings. Um, so that, that was actually um, quite helpful. And I think thematically, for people who read and um, read Good Bones and for people that it, that poem really resonated with, I think this book is sort of almost a continuation of that conversation that I'm having with readers because this book is still really about finding light or, or even making light in dark times and the responsibility that we have um, to ourselves and to our children, and if we don't have children, at least to the next generation, um, to leave the world better than we found it if it's in our power to do so. Um, and so I wrote about it a little bit more obliquely in, in Good Bones and then in Keep Moving. Uh, I think I'm writing about those issues a lot more directly and personally. And what does it feel like um, whenever you see you know, of course you just had a book come out, so you're getting a lot of press and a lot of mentions, but until like the last couple of months, what do you feel like every time you see your name, like if you open up Twitter and you see that you've been tagged like a hundred million times, like what's the first thing that goes to your mind? I mean, now this week it's like, oh good, people are reading Keep Moving and buying it for their neighbors and friends and sharing it and it's helping, it's doing its work. Um, pre this book, when, if my mentions were going up, it was most certainly with good bones. Um, I would have a much more ambivalent response because of course it's a good thing when people are reading your work, that's what we want. That's, you know, we're writers. We want people to read what we make, but uh, it is a complicated feeling when people are sharing your work because something bad has happened. So, you know, my response, if it turns out to be people sharing good bones, I just go find out what happened. Um, I don't go and start responding to people and saying, thanks for sharing my poem, thanks for the retweet. No, I mean, I, I feel like I have to go and find out what are we dealing with here? What's, what has happened? If I've been away from my phone for a while, what, you know, what has happened? And that, um, that as a writer is, is sort of a strange, a strange phenomenon, I think. So let's move on to the keep moving posts. You know, Good Bones is out there. It's become, you know, it's really become part of the zeitgeist. And now you start writing these keep moving posts. Um, and, you know, it's really like self-talk. It's not really, 
weren't, you know, I wasn't Rebecca or, you know, whoever's on this, this event. We weren't your primary audience. The primary audience was you. How did, you know, what made you start this? Well, you know, a lot of this project comes from the idea that we deserve the compassion that we extend to others, but we often do not give that to ourselves. So if my best friend or neighbor or sister or brother-in-law came to me and said, my marriage has ended, or I miscarried, or I lost my job, or I have this terrible diagnosis and I don't know what's going to happen, I would never say, well, if you were a different kind of person, that wouldn't have happened to you. Or if you had done X, that wouldn't have happened. Or maybe, you know, you don't deserve good things because this happened to you. But I think this is honestly how we talk to ourselves. We carry a lot of guilt and shame and we blame ourselves too often when things happen in our lives that are painful, um, whether they're our fault or not. And so really what I needed to do in the very beginning when I was struggling hard was have a kinder conversation with myself. And I really do think the most important conversation that we have every day is the conversation we have with ourselves. And no matter how many friends or relatives or colleagues tell you, no, you're great, you're going to be fine, you're wonderful, things will get better. If you're not telling yourself that and at least half believing it, it that stuff just slides right off of you. It doesn't actually soak in. And so as many people were telling me it was going to be okay, I had to believe it myself. And to believe it, I had to tell myself that. So yeah, all of the posts in the beginning were notes to self. They were little tiny self pep talks that I posted as a way of staying accountable for that intention and also to sort of come out as someone who was really struggling. Because if there's one thing I've learned from being on social media, it's that we so often share when things are going well. Um, our house is clean, so we take a picture. Our kids say something cute, so we write it down. Um, you know, a, a poem was accepted or a book was accepted, and so we write about that success. And we're not talking about the 50 rejections that we got before that acceptance or the, the door slamming episode that happened with our adolescent daughter or showing the Legos all over the floor or the sink full of dirty dishes. We're not doing that enough, I think. And so the danger in that is that we can each think that we're the only ones having a hard time, that we're the one who doesn't have it all together. And so part of, part of posting so publicly and being vulnerable in front of thousands of people was my way of saying like, see, like, this is just what happens. Like we're all going through stuff and whatever your stuff is, if it doesn't look anything like mine, that's okay. But you're not alone in whatever the struggle is that you're going through. Cause we're all, we're all in it. And my God, this year we're all really, really in it. What together. makes you, I, I don't even know what you're referring to. <laughs> nothing happening this year. In fact, um, ever since I got my advanced review copy of the book, I dog-eared a page because as, as you know, nobody probably knows this, but you and I were supposed to do this event in May. This yeah. was supposed to be happening half a year ago. Um, and clearly it was canceled for obvious reasons. And in fact, I think it's happening at the perfect time. I think we need this six months more than we needed it, you know, in May. We are just that much further down the line of, mm -hmm. um, so much exhaustion and fear and grief um, over so many things. And so I dog-eared one of your, you know, one of one of the vignettes in here. And I just want to share it with everyone because that it really speaks to exactly what you said, which is um, let life be a little ramshackle right now. Let it be messy and jerry-rigged and held together with binder clips and duct tape. Let it not be okay. And for now, that's okay. And like, we're all dealing with our mess, you know, like it's, I love that it's just it's a reminder, like you said, to practice the self-compassion. It is so hard to do that just like on a Tuesday in 
2012. And it's exponentially harder to do that on any given day post March 2020. Um, you know, we're living in a global pandemic. We're either managing kids or managing parents or managing ourselves, managing illness, homeschooling, our own jobs, some all together. And, um, you know, on top of that, we have all these layers of grief grief due to death loss, grief due to the loss of our imagined futures and our known present days. And so I just think that like the thread of the, you like urging people to practice self-compassion is just very, very resonant and very impactful here. And, um, you know, I think that's just why this book at least speaks to me so much and has spoken to so many people who, who, who I know who have read it. Um, I, I'm wondering um, if we could talk a little bit, let's see, we have about 10 more minutes to chat. Um, people have kind of come to see you as, as a guru, but like an accessible one, right? <laughs> like, I feel like one of the reasons I love what you put out there so much is because I don't think of you like when you're writing and you're putting out these wonderful keep movings and I'm like, oh, my, you know, my heart is in my throat because they're so beautiful. I feel like you're not doing it after you've come out of a Bikram yoga class or given like a philosophy lecture to like thousands of people. I feel like you're doing it like while you're drinking an iced coffee that maybe you've also spilled on your white shirt. Is that an accurate? Have you been hiding in my home? <laughs> I have a hidden camera in your home. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. Like uh, someone said fairly early on when I was posting the quotes that one of the things they liked about them was that I wasn't speaking on high as some sort of wise oracle giving advice. And I, I think I sort of jokingly replied, are you kidding? I'm trying to talk myself out of the bottom of a well. Like, first of all, I'm talking to myself. I am not dispensing advice to others. Um, you're just eavesdropping on the advice I'm giving to myself. And if it applies to you and helps, all the better. Um, but no, I mean, I, so I am definitely spilling the iced coffee on myself. And it's probably iced coffee that I left on my counter yesterday forgot about and then stumbled upon today and i thought is that still good eh. and then i just drank it because i paid for it um yeah no I, the idea of of me as being some sort of um fountain of wisdom is is sort of funny and i feel like probably my children would find it even funnier <laughs> because i can't even figure out how to help my daughter with sixth grade math um but i do know something about how to get through hard stuff intact, or at least mostly intact. And all of that is just from my own personal experience. And it may not speak to everyone. Um, it may not align with how everyone would do it or how everyone would process it. Um, I certainly processed my most difficult year as a writer, um, which is why um, I did do a little yoga, actually, um, and uh, I spent a lot of time with friends, and I took up running and um, learned to cook and, you know, did a lot of things to sort of remind myself of who I was apart from that loss and to try to sort of claw my way back to who I was as a person, which is difficult um, after a long relationship when it ends, you have to sort of tease apart who you are apart from the other person and think, okay, so who am I? What did I maybe, what was I going to do if I had been on my own this whole time? What have I let go? What did I sacrifice that maybe I should go back and reclaim? Um, what could I do going forward that maybe I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do had none of this happened. Um, and, you know, it doesn't mean that it balances the scales. It's not that having a new, different life makes all that pain worth it. It's, I don't think it balances the scales. But I, I do think that inside every loss, there is some hidden gift or opportunity that is there if we look for it. And Inside every ending is a, is a beginning of some sort. Absolutely. And, I mean, sometimes cliches are cliches for a reason because they have a really huge grain of truth within them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. When something ends, something else starts. 
even if you didn't ask for it, even if you didn't plan it and you didn't want it, you have to, I mean, no, you don't have to, but I think it's helpful if you look at that as an opportunity to sort of reset and think, okay, what now? What, what do I not have to do now? What do I get to do now that maybe I couldn't have done before? Um, and sort of reframing that for yourself as, mm -hmm. as not just loss, yes, loss, but also as a chance to do something differently maybe. Yeah. As resilience. Um, and endurance. Yeah. I mean, endurance. Yeah. Maybe um, healing is tricky, but endurance is, is another thing altogether, right? Like it doesn't go, the pain doesn't go away, but you learn how to better carry it, I think. Yeah. So in about five minutes, I'm going to move to questions and I want to squeeze in these two questions because I'm really excited to ask them. Um, I'd love to quickly talk about resilience. So we just talked about endurance, resilience and gauging how far we've come because we are all about as Americans, we're all about mm -hmm. progress and like measuring things, metrics, like these words, like I, I don't actually understand a lot of them, which is why I write. Um, <laughs> um, I just you know, I feel like my MO when things get really overwhelming, when the landscape is just way too scary is to go so tiny and so small and baby steps and like get through the next day, get through the next hour, get through the next minute sometimes. And that's how I moved through the darkest days of my grief after mm -hmm. both of my parents died and how I still sometimes get through like Thursday night. Uh, and to me, like the baby steps are the essence of keep moving. And I'm just curious, like you're doing this, this practice, right? And then you're really, it's becoming a habit. At what point, like when was the moment that you realized you'd actually gone a meaningful distance with all of mm. these tiny steps? Yeah, I mean, I joke that I, that hope was sort of like a garment that I was trying on every day as I wrote the posts. And then at first it felt terrible and uncomfortable and oversized and scratchy and like just something I wanted to take off. Um, and put my melancholy back on, which felt very cozy and, and, and fit like a glove at the time. Um, but the more I tried it on, the better it fit. And it's interesting for me now, if I go back through the, the quotes from the beginning, from fall of 2018, I see about four or five months in a shift in tone. And I don't know if anyone else would really pick up on it, but I can see um things feel different for me and you know words like anger and grief that were and fear that were very common in the first three mm. months of daily posts some of those words like if i were to do one of the sort of word bubbles some of those words start to recede a little bit and are replaced by words like hope and possibility um and and light and so i think just doing it over and over again as a practice, what I found is that sort of hope begets hope. Mm -hmm. And the more I did it over and over and over again and wrote and also developed a community online because people were really reaching out and saying, this meant something to me. And when you feel A, alone, and be sort of worthless because that's what you feel like when you're depressed and someone else says you helped me get through today or this hour or whatever it actually makes you feel better um and so both the practice of writing and the and the experience of connecting with other people really helped lift me out of that out of the well so it's almost like you knew what my last question was going to be, um, which is I'd love to talk about joy really quickly um, or even just levity, right? Which is these are like two words that almost feel foreign to us these days. Um, it's just something we don't have a lot of right now. Uh, even when it's in front of our face and it's like clearly like that is a joyful child or like that is a beautiful bird. It's, it's hard for us to register that moment right now because we're just overwhelmed and beaten down. Um, but it is something that we really do owe it to ourselves and on our survival and our ability to thrive to embrace as much as humanly possible. Um, at Modern Loss for years, people have asked me, when is it okay to laugh? Like when's it okay to like, make a joke. And I'm like, 
dude, like whenever you find something funny, you know, like when, and remember that first Sex in the City movie where like Carrie's dumped at the altar and they're like, when it, she's like, am I ever going to laugh again? And Miranda says, yes, when something is really, really funny and it happens, right? Yeah. It can happen at the funeral. It can happen at any time. And you have to just catch that moment and let yourself be caught by it and be taken away because they don't come so frequently. Um, and I feel like there's this guilt that comes along with celebrating joy in bad times, but we have to not feel that way, right? Oh, I, mm. I think we absolutely have to not feel that way. I mean, I get that you know, it, it can feel, we can feel guilty right now laughing or having a good time because there is so much suffering. There just is, there is so much suffering. Also, there's always so much suffering. Um, and, but I do think it's not just about surviving, it's about living. And I, I need to be able to live. I need to live fully. And that means doing more than survive. And it means, yes, being able to enjoy parts of my day. Um, this reminds me, I, one of the quotes in the book is, do not turn away joy, even if it arrives at an inconvenient time, even if you think you should be grieving, even if you think it's too soon. Joy is always on time. Keep mm -hmm. moving. And I, I believe that. I also think in times like this, it's almost a defiant thing to feel joy, to insist on joy. Um, to find pockets of relief in our days and weeks and months in quarantine um, because we are here and we are alive and this life is a one-off. We do not get to do it again and we can't just be clenching our teeth and gutting it out. We need to be um, wringing as much goodness as we can, mm -hmm. as we can from it um, and not feeling, feeling bad about being able to do that, even as we mourn, even as we grieve. Yeah. I saw a meme yesterday and it just said, you were not put on this earth to pay taxes and try and lose five pounds. Yeah. And I was just like, struck me. I'm like, you're right. Like we have to live. It's a one-off. We might as well enjoy the parts that we can. Yes. Um, so I want to give, um, there are a lot of questions. So I'd love to give about 10 minutes. To, to of attention to that. Um, so first, I'm going to combine two of them, um, Timothy and Mike. Uh, first, what books have had, like 2020, kind of a mess, right? So what has most uh, helped keep you going during the stresses of 2020? And also, what books have helped you during this stressful time? Oh, that's a good question. Um, what has helped keep me going is... Um, finding things to do that make me feel like myself and remind me of who I was, the person who predated the loss. Because that's, I think, what we sometimes don't think about when there's some kind of loss, whether it's um, the loss of a loved one or pregnancy loss or the loss of our marriage or the loss of our job and whatever the, whatever the loss is, sometimes we forget that we predate that that we existed before that and we will exist after it. And so trying to remember who I was before. And so for me, that is um, reading a lot, listening to a lot of music, buying too many books and records, um, spending a lot of time with my kids and um, really focusing on them and also cultivating my other relationships, You know, really spending more time as much as I can now um, six feet apart from friends and family and, and writing because that's, that's the, the best I feel most of the time is when I'm having that conversation with myself on paper. That's when I feel closest to myself. Um, books I've read that have helped me through this, um, I would say all books. <laughs> My editor and I have had this conversation about all literature being self-help in that um, reading books makes us feel better. And frankly, reading anything sparks your imagination and helps you see how elastic a human life can be and what is possible. That maybe when you're feeling very claustrophobic in your own life and in your own grief, which I think we all are feeling quite claustrophobic right now, um, it can help. So, you know, when I was going through my divorce, people would send uh, Pima Chodron books to me, which I loved. 
Um, someone sent me Kitchen Table Wisdom, which is another book I loved and then bought and uh, in multiple copies and sent to people when they were having their own troubles. Um, Constellations by Sinead Gleason, an Irish writer I loved. And then just lots and lots and lots of poetry, as much poetry as I could get my hands on. Thanks, those are really wonderful recommendations. Um, let's see if we can get a couple more. Um, someone writes, divorce is a form of grief, obviously, clearly. How do you mine your grief for your writing without falling down the rabbit hole of inescapable anguish? Oh. And obviously, it's a toughie. Uh, I mean, the short answer, which is sort of jokey, is you don't. I mean, if you write about that experience, you will go down some rabbit holes. Um, you know, I think probably the saddest thing I've ever written was an essay I wrote about my divorce that was published in the New York Times as, the, as a part of the Modern Love. Um, and it's actually on their podcast today, I believe. But um, mm -hmm. it was incredibly painful. I joke that it's basically good bones without the last two sentences. Like it's the <laughs> bad, bad, bad before the hope kicks in. Um, you know, it's painful to write about personal experiences, especially if you're still in it and not writing about it from some other side where you have the perspective. Um, do I think it's worth writing about personal experiences even if they're hard? Yes. Do I think we are obligated to do so if it's painful and it doesn't actually help us heal? No. I think it's perfectly fine to have a sort of moratorium on writing those things. If we're not ready, we're not obligated. Um, it's tricky too, because we have to protect other people's privacy. Um, so it's, it's a big responsibility, I think, to write about our personal lives. Um, and I, I, I take it, I take it really seriously and try not to fall down too many rabbit holes. Um, so let's see, we have about five more minutes. Hopefully we can get to a couple more. How about this is a big one, but maybe we could do it uh, okay. <laughs> in a encapsulated way. What is your writing process? Ooh, that is a big one. Yeah. Um, my writing process is, is a complete and total disaster. Um, I write in a notebook because I never learned how to type. So I only use um, these two fingers. So yes, I wrote keep moving with my index fingers. Um, this is what my writing process looks like. This is one of my notebooks. It's disastrous with arrows and lots of, it's just, it's a mess. So I tend to sort of write things down um, as I hear a line in my head or see something in nature or hear my child say something. Um, I'll write that little scrap down. And then if I'm lucky, it will prompt another scrap. And if I'm not lucky, I'll let it sit and steep like a cup of tea for a while and I'll come back to it in a week or a month or a year and see if any other ideas or images want to attach themselves to that one and I kind of cobble it together. Um, Good Bones was very different in that I read that. I just wrote that poem in one sitting which is really strange um, but most of the time it's I'm sort of a magpie you know the birds that find little little sparkly things and collect them. I tend to accrue over time and it might take months, um, sometimes even years to finish one essay or one poem. It's a long game. <laughs> it's a long game. Um, so let's see. Uh, hi, Maggie, thanks for your inspiring book. I love the essays. You mentioned in one affirmation that grief doesn't get better day by day in a predictable way. Time doesn't take another stone off the pile each day until the pile is gone. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing if yes. it were just that clean a process? How did you know when you were through grieving? And what did that feel like? You know, it's funny. I was reading one of the essays for, um, I think it was a booksellers um, conference recently. And I got to a line in one of the essays that said, I'm not over the pain of my divorce yet. And I realized in reading that sentence that I could just redact that sentence. And if I read this essay publicly going forward, I will skip that sentence. I will not read it. And I, I don't think I realized 
that I wasn't feeling the pain of it anymore until I read a sentence I wrote when I was feeling the pain of it and it, it no longer applied. I mean, it's complicated. I, I won't say, you know, co-parenting is not easy, but I'm not feeling the grief of it anymore. And reading my own words is what made me realize it. To me, that makes sense because people, you know, ask me clearly, I work within the world of grief and loss and they say, you know, how do you, how do you feel like you're, you're grieving all the time? And I'm like, you know, I don't view myself as great. I mean, now I'm grieving a lot, but like, mm -hmm. you know, both of my parents died several years ago and it's, I view it more as at this point living with loss and it feels more like an active state than a, like a, like come and get, come and pummel me state of grief. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it changes, it doesn't end, it just changes form, you know? Um, so let's see, okay, ooh, one more question, let's see. Um, uh, can, I, can I challenge you here a little bit? Uh, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> While I have always loved your poetry, I found myself craving more of the short essays that tied the tweets and quotes together. Do you think you'd write a memoir on this topic? Or have you said all that you have to say? That's a good question. I don't know. That is a really good question. I don't know what else I have to say about this. I mean, I think um, if I wrote a memoir, it would probably be less about my divorce and more about living post-divorce um, and particularly about uh, mothering my children um, and what it looks like to do that now, which is very different from what it looked like yeah. before. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the lovely things about having written this book and sort of written about a lot of difficult topics from my divorce to miscarriage to postpartum depression is that I've done it now and, um, and I can choose whether I want to keep doing it or I, I might just get to let it lie.